So uh, tonight I'd like to make a video in English uh, speaking about harmony in both Eastern and Western music and I'm hoping to create a lesson that is so simple that's going to make a lot of a concept like chord progression very simple and straightforward like going down a slide. In all of uh, modal and tonal music which encompasses much of uh, uh, pre-baroque music, baroque, uh, romantic music, much of 20th century music, jazz and pop music, and even uh, m much music of many, many cultures. The simple concept that you have is that you have a home key and you usually either go up a slide and just slide down or you go down the, towards the steps of a slide, you go up and you slide down and you repeat. Chord progression and harmony is really nothing but that. So uh, I'm gonna, in this video, I'm gonna talk about some simple concepts. I'm hoping that I will make it so oversimplified that you'll be like laughing by the end how simple everything was. So charts like this or like that will just look like nothing to you by the end of this video. And the importance, if I get a chance, I will explain to you the most important chord in all of music, Eastern and Western, is uh, the 5 7 chord, which is just playing G, B, D, e, and F on a piano. Uh, so you might have seen pictures like this, uh, but I'm hoping that I can come up with some simple rules that just will make it very easy. First of all, harmony has different meanings. Harmony in physics and in, when you talk about a chord in music, you're talking about frequencies of two tones that are ratios that are very uh, small. Small numerator, small denominator, 2 to 1, like 200 hertz to 100 hertz, 300 hertz to 100 hertz, 3 to 2, 300 hertz to 200 hertz. The, basically, the ratio between the two numbers, it could be, let's say, 450 hertz to 150. The ratio is 3 to 1. Uh, so even some number like 450 hertz to 150 hertz is really like 3 to 1. So harmony in physics and harmony in when you talk about a chord, you're just saying that two tones are helping each other out, they're creating a resonance, they're creating an interesting texture together. So here I'm going to go and show you some examples. Um, here basically I've, I'm plotting in Google. I'm just typing, typing sine of 3t plus sine of basically adding two sine waves. If I just type uh, sine of 3t, you'll just get um, a sine wave. Where is it? Oh, here. And the amplitude is just, it's like your string or air or the uh, top of your um, soundboard and your guitar vibrating up and down. You, and the amplitude is, let's just say, one, it's going up and down one millimeter or one whatever. But when you have two different uh, frequencies, two different strings, two different frets, they add up to give you a texture. So one meaning of harmony is when different frequencies add up and sometimes they help each other as you see the amplitude is becoming two and sometimes they cancel each other and they give you a texture like that. You, I'm going to just for the fun of it, I'm just going to do another ratio three plus five just to see what the hell we get and you get a different texture. If you don't understand this stuff, it's okay, don't worry about it. But the point is that they, sometimes they add up, they get stronger, they get louder, but this is happening very quickly. And uh, sometimes they cancel, but overall you get a different texture. A lot of times, uh, m uh, music theory books and teachers talk about uh, the harmonics and overtone series has nothing to do with that really. Even though the numbers and the math sound similar, 
Here, sine waves do not have, this is an advanced topic now, sine waves do not have harmonics, they don't have overtones. Everything is what happens in time. Two sine waves, if they are different frequencies, they sometimes add up and they sometimes subtract. Let's do another one just for the fun of it, just to take a look. 3t plus 7t, let's see what we get. We're just having fun here, fiddling around, see what textures we get. Funky. All right. So here I have this thing called a uh, uh, tone generator. This is a the note A on the piano, A4, and it's giving me 440 hertz. Can you hear that? Oh, I wonder if I should double it. Oh, wow. That's loud. Okay, so if I have A, and if I play some other note, let's say E, I'm going to get something that sounds like a chord. And if here I pick, uh, actually, let's hear what I have here. This uh, is C, but it's not quite C. This is a neutral, it's a Middle Eastern interval. You don't have a, here you don't have a major third, you don't have a minor third, you have a neutral third. But now let's pick C5 anyways to make it exact and make it more like what you would get on a piano. This is uh, E. And this is just A. See the simple frequency is very boring. It's just tone. It's not that interesting. But if I start adding more tones to it, I get some texture. So I'm getting a chord right now. And using this tone generator, let me show you the website. It's this address right here, and you can have fun uh, adding different ratios and different numbers. All the numbers that it was punching in the other one, you could just type, I don't know, let's say 200 hertz. Well, let's pick something that is more audible. Uh, let's pick, I don't know, 600 hertz. Um, yeah. I'll just type it in. 600 hertz. Is it going to be too loud? And I don't know, 600 is 2 times 300. Let's do 300 maybe. Yeah, let's do 300. Let's do 400. Let's do 500. You can have fun doing all kinds of funky things and explore notes that are not really on the piano. Have fun. So, anyway, so the point was that you get all kinds of different textures. If I here add 8 and 9, you almost get what C and D, or a whole tone interval, should be. Almost. But this is just intonation. The frequency ratio between a C and D should technically be 9 to 8. And here it looks like they just added up to one sine wave. Uh, but if I, whoopsie. Oh, do you see that? They sometimes cancel and something. You get a beating pattern of sorts. Okay, so okay, this is just something for you to do. This is just Google. You can just type in all kinds of numbers and get all kinds of funky things. As these numbers uh, become larger and larger, more than seven or eight or nine, you still have harmony, but it's not um, as good as when the ratios are two to three or two to one or three to four and so forth. When the ratios, uh, the numerator and the denominator of that ratio is small, you get what we call usually a consonant. But as the numbers get larger, you get dissonance. With dissonance, just means less harmony. It does not mean a complete clash of harmony. 
like for example if I type in 800 and 805 these frequency bit ratio is very much different and all you get practically is a beating pattern this is when you're tuning two strings in a piano or on a guitar and they're kind of close but not really they're a little bit off you get a beating pattern the amplitude is adding up and dying completely if I do it here like 440 if I hear coming and type in 441 this is what you get um, this is what you're getting if I increase this at some point you can't count it anymore your ear begins to hear one thing okay so uh, so when you look at a normal piano the keys on the piano are laid down in a kind of a linear fashion. They seem to be very separate and they seem to be just going up in pitch in a very linear fashion. But what you really have is that you have a web. You have like a spider web of these notes have all kinds of connections with each other. This pitch is related to that pitch. Anyone who knows anything about music knows that there's such a thing as octave. So if you play a melody here, And somebody says, oh yeah, well that's nothing, I can come up with a better melody and says... And you say, well you just played what I just played, you just played it an octave higher. So when you look on a piano, it looks like we have 88 keys, but you really, some people would say all music, all Western music at least is coming from just the 12 keys in one octave. So here's an interesting fact. Every note, every note is and it is not like the note an octave above and an octave below. For the most part, every key is very similar. You know, if you play it for people who don't know anything about music, of Western music or anything, if you just said, hey, how is this? How is this related to that? They would just say it's different. They wouldn't, if you just played these two notes and if they didn't know any music, they wouldn't really think that these are very similar. But anyone who knows a little bit about music may be able to tell him this is just an octave. In a similar fashion, every one of these, so we think we have 88 keys, but it seems like it can be reduced to 12. That statement is and it is not true those people those of you who know about harmony already but just to prove that that's not sometimes that's not true the thick chords for it's this is for people who know harmony when you begin to have chords that have three notes four notes five notes when you invert these codes the feeling the functionality changes they're not exactly the same thing Inverting means when you take the bottom note of a chord and you flip it to an octave above. When you start doing that, these chords kind of change character. In fact, again, for people who already know about uh, harmony, cadential 6-4 is a prime example of that. But anyways, so every note is and is not similar to an, uh, an octave, a note of an octave above it or below it. But, but then you may think like, well, then we have only 12 notes to fiddle with. But it turns out that it's even worse than that because every note is just like its fifth above and its fifth below. So this G, in a way, is just like uh, D here, one, two, three, four, five. And it's kind of similar to this C. 
Therefore, if I play a melody here, and then somebody says, well, that's nothing, I can play something very nice and better. Like you said, you just played what I played, you just moved it five notes above. And somebody else comes and says, oh, that's nothing, I can play something better even. Well, that, you know, so every note, in a way, is very similar, is and it is not similar, to another note, one-fifth, one, two, three, four, five, fifth above it, and fifth below it. Well, gosh, that seems like then we don't even have 12 notes, we only have four notes then. Except that it's even worse than that. <laughs> Every note is just like it's third, a third above it, or a third below it. That statement is and it isn't true. Uh, for example, here I made a, uh, do do do, I made a, uh, I call it parallel interval, in intervals, I call it intervites. You know, so here, let me see, I have two melodies, an octave apart, and I'm soloing, so we just hear these two, yeah. Well, let's listen to the first one, first one only. Okay, let's, let's, yeah, let's play this. Well, if I add an octave above it and play them together, sounds pretty much the same, it's really just an octave above, it doesn't seem like I did anything. Uh, then, <laughs> if I do it, uh, let's see, what else did I do? Uh, C and A, I did it C and F, this is a fourth above C, D, E, F. I would say it has a funky medieval sound. It's not very interesting. It's not silky, at least to my ear. But uh, I know music theory professors who recommend doing parallel fourth. I don't know how. This is parallel fifth. Now, in a lot of primitive cultures and in medieval times, they would do they would do one melody and they would do uh, another melody, a perfect fifth above it. funky and a very medieval sounding and um, kind of hollow as if some ghost is <laughs> you and your ghost are uh, playing at the same time it's a kind of it doesn't sound interesting and in medieval times they did that and it's called parallel um, plain song or plain chant and this was the first attempt at polyphony in uh, western music actually going back to 9th century AD. Uh, so, so we heard C to G. Oh, that sounds like the same thing. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a perfect fifth, but this is just any kind of fifth interval, okay. And this is perfect third, and all of a sudden, we're hearing something silky and velvety and beautiful. Uh, this is, when this is playing C, that plays E. When this is playing, so the simple melody by itself sounds like this okay but when we play them together it doesn't sound like you're hearing something completely different it sounds like the same thing but just more velvety with texture All 
of a sudden we're hitting gold because the other ones were either too similar or too similar in a ghosty fashion but now the the third here sometimes it's a major third sometimes it's a minor third so it's changing and when I so B to D is a minor third with that changing of a third and the funky thing is that that third could even be the Middle Eastern neutral third which is neither major nor minor it's halfway I have examples of that too but it's actually let me just show you for the heck of it just you can tolerate that so this is a sixth well it's really similar if you flip it an octave it'll be like third and even though this is a quarter tone scale and the interval is not like a major or minor third it still you feel the funkiness the the, uh, the texture a different texture See, even this is, even though this is an Eastern music and it's a different culture, different intervals and so forth, you still feel, you hear that interference between the frequencies. And this, that, and that's why I'm hoping this video will provide an alternative view to harmony because most uh, classic textbooks on harmony would tell you that harmony and chord progression are, uh, are cultural conventions mainly because every century had its own funky ways of what was fashionable with chord progression. But I would argue that the problem was that they just didn't know how to do it right. It's very much like painting. At some point they were doing sketches, then they were doing flat color paintings, but then they learned how to do shading and how to do um, textures and so forth. And over time, we became more sophisticated. I think it's as simple as that in many ways. Um, and of course, you know, and your ears get used to new things, but definitely, I don't think it's just that it's not, if, if things from medieval era sound funky, it's not because uh, they were used to, which is true, they were used to funky chords and funky sounds, but generally because they had nothing else available to them. And just like if you look at paintings from ancient Egypt, they thought that is painting, you know. They had some shading, shockingly. If you look at old ancient Roman and uh, Egyptian paintings, they actually had some shading. You do sense a sense of three-dimensionality looking at the portraits, fa facial portraits that they, they did and so forth. It's amazing. But anyways, but uh, bottom line, yes, if the human beings had that kind of... That, if that was all that was available to them, that's what they expected and that's what they saw as normal. Uh, so here, by the time we get to apparel third, we get an interesting texture. Here, apparel uh, fifth, that's apparel perfect fifth. Then I have apparel fourth. This is apparel second. Let's listen to it. So when this is C, this is D. Let's just see what it sounds like. It sounds really funky. And sometimes the second is a minor second, so it's particularly funky. If I made it a perfect second, a major second, like two half tones, it'd be, I think it'd be even funkier. Let's do it just for the heck of it. Artistry is all about messing around, so. Okay, I think you heard enough. <laughs> so it's really not until we start using thirds that we realize, oh, that's where the gold is, that's where the fun part is, and all of Western music is really based on thirds. You know, so when we talk about a chord, C, E, G, E is a third to C, and G is a third to E. And uh, going back to the keyboard, going back to the keyboard, I would, you know, when we heard parallel thirds, it didn't seem like we were hearing two different melodies completely. It seemed like you were, you were hearing the main melody, 
that was texturized and had was more velvety. So I would argue that every note is and it is not like it's third above or third below. And that third could be minor, could be major, or could be even this neutral third that I showed you. And there's a certain amount level of harmony with different levels of funkiness here. But as you get closer here, it's very dissonant. So uh, when we talk about harmony, a second meaning of harmony is management of dissonance. Dissonance does not mean extremely uh, inharmonious and cacophonous sound. It means intervals that have some harmony, but not a whole lot. These two are a ratio of 9 to 8. They're not horrible, but they're not that good. C to G is almost too perfect. C to C is too perfect. But usually in music, what we want is uh, dissonance. We do want the uh, less harmonious. We never play C in a quarter tone above C. That would be really cacophonous. If you've, if you've never heard... <laughs> If you ever want to hear, right, maybe I should show you an example, just for the hell of it. How can I do this? Oh, yeah, I'll show you. When two notes... Is it, this is a quarter tone different from this. Actually, let me take it to the same octave so it sounds really bad. Yeah, if you thought a tritone is bad, let's see, do I, did I do it right? Did you hear that? What, you know, for an effect, it might be nice. If you want to do a funky effect, that might be okay. Um, yeah, let's do this one. G and E, well, let's, let's bring it again. Uh, this is quarter tone. Bring it to C just for the hell of it. Now everything is quarter tone. Up. Well, you know, for a funky, you know, do you hear the ring? It's really ringy and interesting. So, anyways, the point is that hey, the, when we talk about um, dissonance, we usually talk about the worst dissonance you have on a keyboard is either a tritone. If you play these two at the same time, or tritone from here to here, or, but these are still not horribly inharmonious. They're dissonant, but they're not funky like what I just played for you. Although that stuff could be good for some effect in some situations too. So the second meaning of harmony is uh, controlling or managing. Uh, managing what you might call it uh, dissonance so um, so your music you the, the flow of music is coming down you don't want it to be perfectly smooth and perfectly harmonious everything being octave or fifth and no rocks or anything because that's not if it was a pipe it wouldn't be very interesting a dike you know like America used to Instead of freeways, we used to have dikes in this country carrying things around. We had a whole network of dikes in America. But you want to have r just enough rocks. If it was all rocky, it wouldn't be that interesting. It would be too dissonant. And that's the problem uh, that 20th century music has. is Because composers became more and more and more interested. Musicians, too, uh, became more and more interested in the spices you get out of dissonance. And because they could taste them, they could see the differences, like French wine or red wine or Bordeaux. Whereas the average person couldn't follow all this dissonance, dissonance anymore. And uh, so, so in 20th century, we have all kinds of experiments with adding all kinds of dissonances into music. And a lot of it, because again, a, a good musician's ears and good composers, they can't have enough of this because they find all kinds of spices in this thing. And that's why there was a dissociation. The majority of people could not follow modern music anymore. It was too dissonant. But for most people, and that's what you have in 18th and 19th century music, 
you have just enough rocks to create some turbulence, some dissonance, but the dissonance has to be resolved into smooth and then dissonance and harmony and dissonance to make it pleasant to a lot a lot of us today even because the average person um, does not have the ear for a lot of dissonance so anyways um, so that's an analogy but in all of music you really what you have at least all of tonal and modal music you have a home key you throw the ball, you pick a place where you want it to go, and from there on, there's a natural path that the, uh, that the chords take to come down to the home key. And sometimes you can trick it and get it stuck here in some kind of loop or some trick to get it stuck in here, but for the most part, you want to come back here. Sometimes you, cha you change the key, so instead of guiding it here, you trick it, you... It's as if you tilted the whole machine, this pinball, you tilted it, and so it's going this way now. And then you, again, kick the ball up, you throw it on some kind of court, and then you either follow the natural path, or you kick it around, do funky things, do for variety. Look at all these different pinball machines. Look at all the designs. Wow, we forget how that this was such a huge part of culture at some point <laughs> before uh, uh, Pac-Man and before all kinds of other games. Okay, so uh, so we go back to the simple analogy of you're down in your home key, then sometimes you just go up and you come down, but sometimes you go up to the ladder, you climb the ladder, you come down. Most modal and tonal music follows this simple rule. I'm going to show you how you could think of it as a spiral too, that all chord progressions could be uh, thought of as a, in, in its natural sense uh, if you don't if you don't try to fiddle with it and mock with it too much uh, it's almost like a planet and this uh, is the orbit of the satellite and it finally comes down to home. I'll show you how that works out. But right now what I was trying to show you is that to think of the note one note as just being a note separate from other notes is as if you're thinking about a house separated from its second and third and fourth stories. Uh, you're really closing your eyes to what a note is. A note is not the fundamental unit of music as Jean-Philippe Rameau, who was uh, contemporary to J.S. Bach actually pointed out for the first time, that a note by itself is really not that, it's the first floor of a building. You have to think of the third of it as the second floor. This, this is the first floor of the house. That's the second floor. That's the third floor. That's the fourth floor. Sometimes this is even the fourth floor and so forth. Fifth floor and so forth. So, uh, if you just think of this note as something by itself very different from all these other notes, no, there's a whole web, and we do not have a graphical way of representing this connection. This is connected to this, this is connected to that, that's connected to this, this one's connected to that. There's so much interconnectivity, but again, it's because of those ratios I was talking about. This note to this note, we call it a perfect fifth, but it's a frequency ratio of 3 to 2. And then if you go another fifth, it's a frequency ratio of 3 to 2 again. So this note to this note is uh, 3 halves of 3 halves is 9 fourths. is a ratio of 9 to 4. And so there's so much connectivity we can... So going back to simplifying all modal and tonal music, I would say that you're at a home key. All of jazz and tonal, uh, Wagner, Richard Wagner and Mahler and Beethoven and Bach and Mozart and pop music, you are at a home key, you go to this note, then you go to this note, then you come back home. That sounds really strange and a lot of people who know music may think, may wonder what the heck I'm talking about. So it's like you're at home.
So um, you're at the bottom of the, the slide in the uh, playground. You walk up to the steps. You climb the steps. You slide down. And in fact, they call this note the leading note. It leads you here. Usually you want this one to be half tone below your home key, so it really slides down beautifully. Let me crank it up a little bit. So you, if you see you're doing a circle, like that spiral that I was just now showing, you're doing a spiral and coming down to home. Sometimes you don't even do that, you just go down here and down here. This is your one chord, this is your five chord, the infamous, this is seven, but five chord is just like some five and seven are really the same thing. So here we go, let me just tell you a little bit, this is the first degree of your scale, first degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth or first, ninth or second, tenth or third, eleventh, 12th or 5th and 13th. So in its most simplistic fashion, your music could be just between this note and this note. In fact, any melody can be harmonized using the one chord and this, I call it the 7, but it's really the 5, 5 and 7 are the same. So let's expand this a little bit. So instead of saying three times this and three times that, let's expand this guy and bring his family into the equation. Bring the second floor and the third floor of the house. Now I'm going to expand instead of repeating, I say. So we expand it a little bit more. Uh, the spiral opens up a little bit. We, we do this thing. We do this circle. Okay, so let's expand it. When you do, possibly historically, this is maybe, and that's how it possibly came to some people. And of course, when you do this experiment, you quickly realize that this seven chord, and if you did look at, if you looked at the five, because five and seven are very similar, we just said, this chord has two notes in common. The five chord has B and D, and the B chord or the seven chord has B and D also. So instead of doing seven, you could do five. Or even better, you could combine the five chord and the seven chord, which through which you get the GBDF, the five seven chord that I was talking about. I was talking about GBDF, the most important chord in all of music, 5 7. It's a 5 because it's on the fifth degree of the scale, and they call it a 7, a 7 chord because it has a root, third, fifth, and seventh. So let's expand our thing. Instead of saying bomb, 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 we say. So they could expand it. Here I just used the five chord bum 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 bum, but I could mix them together and could use that five seven chord. A 
end it like that. So combine the five chord and the seventh chord, seven chord here, seven, nine, eleven, and do G E D F. It's the most important chord in all of music because it has the most tendency. G is the spiritual brother, the spirit of C really. Uh, this B is just half tone away, it's just leading, it's like a, if you were a, uh, what you would call it, a carriage stuck in a hole and somebody pushed you back and forth and you were not really moving out of a hole because you're going bam. There's almost like very little movement, like you're trying to get out but you're not really getting out. Someone's rocking you. So when you're in this note, you're almost it's just a tiny rock away from coming back here. Uh, so, so let's come. Uh, let's uh, continue a little bit. Now, two is just like four, and, and I'm saying the note two is just like four, but even worse than that is the chord two. Chord two is this note, this note, and this note. Let's show it uh, over here this note, this note, and this note, and a four chord is here and here and here, so they have two notes in common. So, instead of using the two chord, I could use the four chord. I could maybe combine them, use a little bit of both. Instead of going one, two, seven, one, I can say one, four, seven, one, or one, four, five, one. Five and seven are the same, two and four are the same thing. I'm really oversimplifying, of course, but it's just a way of remembering things. Uh, when you um, so, so let's actually expand the, the spiral. So the, in the shortest path, it's right here. But when you want to expand it, the pinball can go over here and come back down. But you could expand it to here. It could go from here to here to here to here. Okay, well, let's do that. So let's do it again. I can expand the spiral even more. So before going to this six, this is a six, I can go six degree scale. I can go to three. So, I can go to 3, go to 6, go to 2, go to 7, go to 1. And in all of these cases, I can replace the 7 with 5 or 5, 7. So let's do it again. So let's do it without expanding first. Just randomly playing a certain number of notes, it doesn't matter. Let's do it again now. So expand it. Five seven four uh, at the end. So in all the, so so here I'm trying to show that spiral. Now this spiral, if you just remove the seven and use five instead, has a different name and it's called the circle of fifth progression. Meaning, if you were on if you're doing the three chord, 
do I have enough notes here? You can circle a fifth means go down to your fifth degree down. One, two, three, four, five. Do that one. And and we just said that the spiral goes like this, so that would be the right one. So do go fifth down here, then fifth down again. One, two, three, four, five. You're doing the D, which is again what we talked about. Then go five down. One, two, three, four, five, which is the, the your fifth, uh, your five chord, but. Uh, we just said 5 and 7 are the same. In our spiral, we, we were using 7, but you can get to 5 this way. And then if you go 5th down, you get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, back to your home. So it would be like going from 3 to 6 to 2 to 5 to 1. Now instead of counting 5 down, I have a little trick. I call it at three, which means if you're at six, at three, you go to nine. If you had nine, which is two, at three, you go to five. If you had five, at three, you go home, which is the same as that spiral, really. It's, it's just that uh, this at three is using the five, which is a better core. Your 5 chord and especially 5 7 chord are better than your 7 chord, uh, the chord that starts on the 7. So, one more time. Uh, so, to so add 3 is just a circular fifth. Instead of saying from G1, 2, 3, 4, 5, go down 5, you can just say add 3. This is 5 plus 3, 8. Now, another thing is that sometimes when you have a chord, you can subtract 2 because you almost get the same chord let's say um, let's see what could we use 4 if I subtract 2 I'm almost getting a very similar chord because I have these two notes I just played these two notes I'm going to be using them again but because I'm introducing a new a lower bass it sounds like the same thing, but with a new bass, so it has a novelty to it. So it's as if you took the same chord and you kind of reused it, extended it, used it. Um, you didn't go to a different chord really that much, but because you introduced a new bass, listen to it. Let's say... See, these two notes are common between the two chords, but I have introduced a new bass. So it sounds novel. It sounds, it's a way of dragging or in, elongating your, it's you hanging out in that same chord really. But, um, but you know, this is a four chord and this is a two chord. Technically they're different chords, but they're really not. Like you will see it. Or seven, It's similar, but you have introduced a new bass, and the ear is interested in a new thing, and a new bass coming into the equation. Or if you are at five, you could go to three. Even though these two notes are the same, are identical to the previous chord, you brought in this thing, you brought novel things to the equation. So when you look at these charts, that you see on the internet and so forth, it's very simple. So add three. Three plus three is six. Six plus three is nine or two. Two plus three is five. Five plus three is eight. Four is just like two, but you can subtract two and it's okay. You can subtract two, you introduce a new base, you go to two. Two, you can subtract two you go to seven. It's very similar, but you're on the two different sides of your center of gravity, your planet that you're trying to go to, and you've introduced a new base. Seven, you can subtract to go to five, because you have uh, 
you have uh, uh, introduced a new base again. Five can technically go to three. I don't see it here. But three plus three, six. Six plus three, nine or two. Two plus three, five. Five plus three, eight. Seven subtract two. And another thing is that five has its own uh, gravity too. Because it's so similar, because five is so similar to one, it's a spiritual, is the spirit of one. Five has, it has its own spiral around it. You can do. You can do a spiral around the five. So you can be, let's say you're doing something one. And then you went to five. And then you do a spiral around five. Oops. Oops. Okay, one more time. And then you do a five, seven. You, so you did five, six, uh, uh, four, five again. And then you wrap it up, make it a five, seven, and go home. So when, whenever you go to five, you could do a little uh, planet, planetary orbit around five two. So it's not just the one that it has its own spiral. You could go five, six, four, five, and then one. And you don't even see that here. Oh, five. Does it show five going to six? Oh. Por qué no? No sé. All right, so... Uh, we talked about the analogy, uh, the analogy of a slide. When I said you can go up and down the the slide directly, boom, boom, boom. When you're uh, at the bottom of the slide, you're at one. You can go directly up and slide down. At one, going to five, to one, and five and seven are really the same thing. One, seven, one. Or you can go at the bottom of the stairs. See, this area is called predominant. This area is called dominant. They should call it climax, really. That's a better term. And then you slide down to home. They call it this area tonic. And um, so, actually, what do we have that could show that? Um, this is your tonic area. One is very similar to three. One is also similar to six. Because again, what the one chord is one, three, five. The three chord is three, five, seven. They're, they have common notes in them. And six is six, one, three. So it has the one, three in common with one. This area is called dominant or the climax, I would like to call it. Uh, and this area is the predominant, the two and four are, are very similar, and that's when you go at the bottom of the slide, you go to the stairs, go up the stairs, go to the top of the slide and slide down. Simple as that. Um, I think I talked about it a little bit. You don't want things to be too harmonious. Har harmony in music can be frequencies matching in a nice way and creating harmony but it could also mean it could be short for tonal harmony or uh, functional harmony same thing which is a series of tricks that the Western music came up with in 18th and 19th century and it wasn't really until 20th century that it became common and it became of uh, everyday use uh, Bach and Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven they didn't know modern uh, tonal uh, theory. They didn't know what predominant. They didn't, they didn't think in terms of chords like the way we do. Uh, they thought in terms of counterpoint, and they had a whole bunch of uh, schemas and uh, patterns that they followed. Um, this idea of chord progression like this is simplifying things, but we are, in a sense, 
losing some details and some fun and freedom that, that you could have had if you just thought of individual lines and how you're treating individual lines with respect to you. So tonal harmony is the management of dissonance, how you go into dissonant intervals and how you resolve them and come back home. Uh, and in fact, you want the dissonance. Dissonance is the spice, it's the little salt, is the little herbs that you use. And you know, the past thousand years of Western music has been a whole history of adding more and more and more spice and going moving away from harmonious sound to more and more dissonant sounds. Really. Uh, what else did I mean to add? I probably forgot a bunch of things. Tone generator. Oh, I have a comp uh, yeah, I have a plot that I forgot to bring up to show you. Um, in terms of what interval, how much harmony you have between different intervals. Okay, and what else? The, the fact that I practically treat C and E and G as like the same note. They are, in a way, spicy versions of each other, basically. And it doesn't matter whether it's E flat, whether it's a minor third or major third. Uh, and then the similarity which we see in the chords, like the one chord is one, three, five. Three chord is three five seven. They have common. They have two common notes. Or five is five seven one. Uh, I mean, so five seven two and seven is seven two four. They have common. Uh, they have common. Uh, they have common notes in them. Uh, so that's that. And uh, oh well, you know this five seven chord is the. Um, most important chord in all of music theory. Let me just add this because I'm shoving a lot of interesting stuff in one video. Um, imagine you were going down a hill in a car or in a carriage. You're playing the C major scale. It's as if someone just stuck a rock or something under your wheel so to stop you from going down they just stuck something in there so you kind of stop here and it gives you it gives a momentary sense of uh, stopping there and hesitating or using that area as a center uh, as a gravitational place to be in could be momentary or it could be that you really want to modulate and go into that key doesn't matter but just putting the half tone there is like putting a rock there. And you could do it anywhere. From there. You could go. Hopefully, you could do it. But you just add this one half tone is not enough. If you have other instruments, it's like having buddies. Your car was going down the hill, you put a rock, your other buddies came. And they created that GBDF 5-7 chord that leads you to this note. Remember that GBDF was to guide you to, towards C. When you wanted to go home to C, GBDF would do this little game. G, every, all these notes were guiding you to go to your home key. This was your home chord, and GB, and oops, and GBDF, and GBDF had everything. This guy was leading toward in that direction. This guy was leading this way. Everything was there to push you towards home. So now that you have decided to use some other note, let's say this G, to be your new permanent key, or maybe just a momentary kind of a, like a dancer, you don't want to be stuck in one place. Sometimes you want to shift your weight and move your foot over here. And for a few seconds, just shift your weight here and then come back. Or maybe permanently. So what you do is that you create the right GBDF that will guide you there. GBDF was guiding us to C, which was a fourth above the G in GBDF. But if you wanted to go to this G... You have to make a GBDF that starts from D. And you use the same intervals. 
The 5-7, it's called dominant 7 port. Another main port is a major minor port because GDDF is a major port. It's four half tones, three semitones, and then three semitones. That's why they call it ma it's a major, they call it major minor because it's a major port with an added minor on top. So now that you want to create this area, even if it's momentary or if it's permanent, you want to go there for a while, but then you create with the other instruments or your other left hand and so forth on the piano, you create what you need, you create the, uh, the, um, the uh, corresponding GBDF that would guide you to this note. The, the, you definitely would have the leading tone for it, but then you have the D, D, four semitones goes over here, then three semitones, then three semitones. You create that five, seven chord that leads you to your target note, whether you're changing key permanently or whether you're just moving. This is called tonicization, tonicization or secondary dominant funky names. But I think a big deal made out of really something very simple. <laughs> I just said it. Your car was going down the hill and somebody stuck a, a stick under your wheel to stop it and uh, bring you here. Same thing with the pinball. Uh, if all the different pinball arms you could control to uh, bring you to the right um, uh, to the right point. Anyway, this is a... Uh, map that somebody, a user named MDEX Music, at their main point of making a lot of videos on the internet is to um, sell software. But this is a map that they've come up with for all of uh, tonal harmony and jazz and so forth. This may sound like a complicated map, but it's really not. First of all, even if this was really this complicated, compared to the map of the planet Earth and all the continents and islands, this is very simple. And to imagine that all of hundreds of thousands of written music, classical, baroque, um, uh, romantic, jazz, all that music is just this map, it kind of makes us wonder, no, you know, no wonder a lot of composers moved away from tonal music and pop music and so forth and modal music and moved towards a tonal or other types of non uh, um, music that is not so uh, directed in a tonal fashion. In its simplest uh, rough scale, here you are in the tonic region, you are at the bottom of the slide, you go towards the stairs, you go up the stairs, you slide down. You're just doing that slight analogy that I told you. And even all these little side excursions are really just little tonicizations, little secondary dominant that I just told you, which is really based on the same thing, really. So, you, so here you go from one, one, like I said, one, three, and six are pretty much similar. This is the tonic function, tonic family. They're very similar to each other. And then two and four are the predominant uh, area. And then here you have 5 and 7, which is the dominant area. So you go from, from the bottom of the slide, you go towards the steps, you climb the steps to the climax, and you slide down from the dominant back to tonic. But even here, you do those types of 5, 7 GBD F tricks to kind of uh, create a little bit of emphasis on this note or that note to create a little bit of side excursions here, a little bit of side excursions here, maybe even here. And that's pretty much it, really. Um, then another topic that's really simple and I'm going to over some is the uh, Italian sixth chord or German or uh, Swiss sixth chord or French sixth chord or the what you would call it the uh, Neapolitan chords, and those are really nothing but just taking a chord like GBDF and taking a hammer to it and taking some of the notes 
pushing them up by half tone, banging one note down, banging one note up, and before you go to GBDF, so we agree that this 5-7 takes you back to home, but before you go there, take a screwed up version of this GBDF, take that GBDF and just hammer it down. Then do the GBDF. I did a very messed up thing just now, but it doesn't matter. So all you do, and you, in jazz they do it all the time. So you just basically take a hammer, move some of the notes, one note, two notes, three notes, whatever. You just hammer it around. It could be a predominant chord. It could be a dominant chord. You just hammer it around, especially by half tone, because if if you take something and you just change it by half tone here and there, the ear knows the similarity. So instead of GBDF, if you said, then, if you just take some of the notes and hammer it a little bit this way, that way, and have fun with it and try, you'll get all kinds of funky chords that uh, right after and the, the, your ear leads you back to GBDF and you can use GBDF to back go back home or you even use a kind of a banged up version of GBDF a little bit because again the ear still knows that yeah this is probably what's happening. Let's see. You know, our ears are so used to so much stuff nowadays that anything goes practically. So anyway, I'm oversimplifying the matter like crazy. But really, a lot of what you see on that map is like the uh, it, the Italian six chord or the Neapolitan chord. Neapolitan chord is really nothing but, it, in fact, it, I think it comes from Middle Eastern or Eastern music in general, probably Greek music. But you have Phrygian and you have the, the double harmonic. Uh, scales. So in those scales, you have a second that is only half tone above your first, and you, you in, when you get your first major chord, you also get a second chord. That is, everything is just half tone above. Like I just said, it's as if you took this chord, and you took a hammer, and moved everything by half tone. It's very similar. Again, your ear can hear that this is similar to that, and uh, you use that chord, and you, they usually use it in second inversion too. But let's just be silly and use it in first. And just slap a five seven to it. And go back home. <laughs> That's the uh, your uh, your Neapolitan chord. Neapolitan chord in Phrygian and in the double harmonic, you have your you have a second chord. The, your two chord is a chord that's just like your one chord, but just half tone raised. Uh, so that's that. I think I covered ninety five percent of tonal harmony tonight. Uh, I, I'll think what I have forgotten to mention and I'll just add it later on in the comments or maybe if you have any questions I can add it to another video. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night.